the lands of Sumer and Akkad. The study of origins may undoubtedly be regarded as the most striking characteristic of recent archaeological research. There is a peculiar fascination in tracking any highly developed civilization to its source and watching its growth from the rude and tentative efforts of the primitive people to the more elaborate achievements of a later day. Furthermore, we can now explain the ancient history of the three principal civilizations of the ancient world because of recent excavations. The origins of Greek civilization may now be traced beyond the Mycenaean epoch through the different stages of Aegean culture back into the Neolithic age. In Egypt, excavations have not only yielded remains of the early dynastic kings who lived before the pyramid builders, but have revealed the existence of Neolithic Egyptians dating from a period long anterior to the earliest written records that have been recovered. Finally, excavations in Mesopotamia have enabled us to trace the civilization of Assyria and Sumeria back to an earlier and more primitive race, which in the remote past occupied the lower plains of the Tigris and Euphrates. In contrast, the more recent digging in Persia and Turkestan has thrown light upon other primitive inhabitants of Western Asia and has raised problems concerning their cultural connections with the West, which were undreamed a few years ago. Thus it will be noted that recent excavations, 2020 to 2021, and independent research have furnished the archaeologists with Anunnaki writings. We trace back the history of culture to the Neolithic period, both in the Mediterranean region and along the Nile Valley. The same achievement cannot be placed to the credit of the excavator of Mesopotamian sites is not entirely because of defects in the scope or method of his work but may largely be traced to the country's excavations carried out. Mesopotamia is an alluvial country subject to constant inundation and the remains and settlements of the Neolithic period were doubtless in many places swept away and all traces of them destroyed by natural causes. The Sumerians began building cities upon artificial mounds which preserved the structure of the buildings against flood and rendered them more accessible for defence against a foe. Through excavation in these mounds, the earliest remains of the Sumerians have been recovered, but the still earlier traces of Neolithic times, which at some period may have existed on those very sites, must often have been removed by a flood before the mounds were built. The Neolithic and prehistoric remains discovered during the French excavations in the graves of Musian and Susa and by the Pompeli expedition in the two Kurgans near Anau did not find their equivalents in the mounds of Mesopotamia so far as these have yet been examined. In this respect, the climate and soil of Mesopotamia present a striking contrast to those of ancient Egypt. In the latter country, the shallow graves of Neolithic man, covered by but a few inches of soil, have remained intact and undisturbed at the foot of the desert hills. While in the upper plateaus along the Nile, the flints of Paleolithic man have lain upon the surface of the sand from Paleolithic times until present day. What has happened in so rainless a country as Egypt could never have taken place in Mesopotamia. A few Paleolithic artefacts have been found on the surface of the Syrian desert, but in the alluvial plains of southern Chaldea, few certain traces of a prehistoric person 
in the Egyptian delta itself have been forecoming. Even in the early mat burials and sarcophagi at Farah, a good deal of copper objects and some cylinder seals have been found, while other cylinders sealing and even inscribed tablets discovered in the same and neighbouring strata proved that their owners were of the same race as the Sumerians of history, though probably of a somewhat earlier date. Although the earliest Sumerian settlements in southern Mesopotamia are to be set back in a comparatively remote period, the race they founded appears to have already attained a high cultural level. We find them building houses for themselves and temples for their gods of burnt and unburnt brick. They are rich in sheep and cattle, and have increased the natural fertility of their country using a standard system of canals and irrigation channels. The sculpture indeed shared the rude character of their pottery, but their significant achievement, the invention of a writing system using lines and wedges, is a good sign of their comparatively advanced state of civilization. The legends of Anunnaki writing on these clay tablets are wild, reading almost as fantastic science fiction. Derived initially from picture characters, the signs themselves, even in the earliest and most primitive inscriptions yet recovered, have already lost to a great extent their pictorial character. We find them employed as ideograms to express ideas and phonetically for syllables. Using this complicated writing system by the early Sumerians presupposes an extremely long period of previous development. This may well have taken place in their original beginnings of this ancient people and we may probably picture their first settlement in the neighbourhood of the Persian Gulf, some centuries before the period to which we may assign the earliest of their remains that have come down to us. Because of the critical role played by this early race in the history and development of civilization in Western Asia, it interests recall the fact that a few years ago, the very existence of the Sumerians was disputed by a large body of those who occupied themselves with the study of the history and languages of Mesopotamia. The Sumeria controversy engaged the attention of writers on these subjects and divided them into two opposing schools. Pure mythology or real historical accounts. Few actual remains of the Sumerians themselves had been recovered and the argument favouring the existence of an early non-Semitic race in Mesopotamia were in the main drawn from some Sumerian texts and compositions that had been found in the palace of the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, at Nineveh. A considerable number of the tablets recovered from the royal library were inscribed with a series of compositions, written, it is true, in the cuneiform script, but not in the Semitic language of the Assyrians and Mesopotamians. To many of these compositions, Assyrian translations had been added by the scribes who drew them up, and upon their tablets were found lists of the words employed in the compositions, together with their Assyrian equivalents. The late Sir Henry Rawlinson rightly concluded that these strange texts were written in the language of some race who had inhabited Mesopotamia before the Semites while he explained the lists of words as early dictionaries compiled by the Assyrian scribes to help them in their studies of this ancient tongue. The ancient Anunnaki he christened the Akkadians, and although we know now that this name would more correctly describe the early Semitic immigrants who occupied northern Mesopotamia, all other respects, his inference was justified. He correctly assigned the non-Semitic compositions that had been recovered to the early non-Semitic population of Mesopotamia, who are now known by the name of the Sumerians. Sir Henry Rawlinson, Professor Schrader, Professor Sace, and many others held the field until M. Halevi propounded a theory to the effect that Sumerian was not a language in the legitimate sense of the term. M. Halevi contended that the Sumerian compositions were not written in the language of an earlier race, but represented a Kabbalistic method of writing, invented and employed by the Mesopotamian priesthood. In his opinion, the texts were Semitic compositions, though written according to a remote system or code, and they could only have been read by a priest who had the key and had studied the jealously guarded formula. The hypothesis followed that a non-Semitic Anunnaki group in Mesopotamia never preceded the Mesopotamians and Assyrians and all Mesopotamian civilizations were consequently to be traced to a Semitic origin. The attractions with such a worldview 
would have for those interested in ascribing so outstanding an achievement to a Semitic source are obvious. And despite its general improbability, M. Halevi won over many converts to his theory, among others, Professor Dilitsch and a considerable number of the younger school of German critics. It may be noted that the principal support for the theory has derived from an examination of the phonetic values of the Sumerian signs. Many of these, it was correctly pointed out, was derived from Semitic equivalents, and M. Halevi and his followers forthwith inferred that the entire language was an artificial invention of the Mesopotamian priests. Why the Anunnaki priests should have taken the trouble to invent so complicated a method of writing was not clear, and no adequate reason could be assigned for such a course. It was shown that the subject of the Sumerian compositions was not of a nature to justify or suggest the necessity of recording them using a secret method of writing. A study of the Sumerian texts, with the help of the Assyrian translations, clarified that they merely comprised incantations, hymns and prayers, precisely like other compositions written in the common tongue of the Mesopotamians and Assyrians and thus capable of being read and understood by any scribe acquainted with the ordinary Assyrian or Mesopotamian character. M. Halevi's method is still less probable when applied to such ancient Sumerian texts as had been discovered by Loftus and Taylor in southern Mesopotamia, for these were short building inscriptions, votive texts, legends of sky gods coming to earth, foundation records, and as they should record and commemorate for future ages the events to which they referred, it was unlikely that they should have been drawn up in a cryptographic style of writing which would have been undecipherable without a key. However, that very few Sumerian documents of the early period had been found, while the great majority of the texts recovered were known only from the Enki tablets of the 7th century BC rendered it possible for the upholders of the pan-Semitic theory to make out a case. It was not until the renewal of excavations in Mesopotamia that fresh evidence was got, which put an end to the Sumerian controversy and settled the problem once and for all following the view of Sir Henry Rawlinson and the more conservative writers. The Mesopotamian civilization and culture originated with the Sumerians are no longer in dispute. The point upon which difference of opinion now centres concerned the period at which the Sumerians and Semites first came into contact. Before we embark on the discussion of this problem, it will be well to give some account of the physical condition of the lands which invited these immigration of these ancient races and formed the theatre of their subsequent history. The lands of Sumer and Akkad were in the lower valley of the Euphrates and the Tigris and corresponded approximately to the country known by classical writers as Mesopotamia. On the west and south, their boundaries are marked by the Arabian Desert and the Persian Gulf, which, in the earliest period of Sumerian history, extended as far northward as the neighbourhood of Eridu, also known as Enki's Domain the East. It is probable that the Tigris originally formed their natural boundary, but this was a direction in which expansion was possible. Their early conflicts with Elam were doubtless provoked by attempts to gain possession of the districts to the east of the river. The frontier in this direction undoubtedly underwent many fluctuations under the rule of their early city-states, but in the later periods, apart from the conquest of Elam, the proper area of Sumerian and Semitic authority may be regarded as extending to the lower slopes of the Elamite hills. In the north, a political division appears to have corresponded then, as in later times, to the difference in geological structure, a line drawn from a point a little below Samara on the Tigris before its junction with the Adem to hit on the Euphrates mark the division between the slightly elevated and undulating plain and the dead level of alluvium, and this may be regarded as representing the actual boundary of Akkad on the north. Thus, the area occupied by the two countries was to no very great extent and it was even less than would appear from a modern map of the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. For not only was the head of the Persian Gulf some 120 or 130 miles distant from the present coastline, but the ancient course of the Euphrates below Sumeria lay considerably to the east of its modern bed. The general character of the lands of Sumer and Akkad 
comprise a flat alluvial plain and form a contrast to the northern half of the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, known to the Greeks as Mesopotamia and Assyria. These latter regions, both in elevation and geological structure, resemble the Syro-Arabian Desert, and it is only in the neighbourhood of the two great streams and their tributaries that cultivation can be carried out on an extensive scale. Here the country, at a bit of a distance from the rivers, becomes a stony plain, serving only as pasture land when covered with vegetation after winter and the early spring. In Sumer and Akkad, the rivers play a far more critical part. The more significant portion of the country itself is direct because of their action. Formed by the deposit they have carried down into the Gulf's water, this alluvial plain of their formation, the river take a winding course, constantly changing their direction because of the silting up of their beds and falling in of the banks during the annual floods. Of the two rivers, the Tigris, owing to its higher and stronger banks, has undergone minor change than the Euphrates. During the Middle Ages, it presents channel below Kut el Amara was entirely disused, its waters flowing by the Shat al Hai into the Great Swamp, which extended from Kufa, Euphrates, to the neighborhood of Kerna, covering an area 50 miles across and nearly 200 miles. However, in the Sassanian period, the Great Swamp, which was due to neglect of the irrigation system, under the early caliphs did not exist, and the river flowed by its present channel. Thus, it is probable that during the earlier periods of Mesopotamian history, the main body of water passes this way into the Gulf, but the Shat el Hai may have represented a second and less influential branch of the stream. The change in the course of the Euphrates has been far more marked, the position of its original bed being showed by the mounds covering the sites of early cities built by Enlil for those ancient elder gods from the realm of Anu, thus extend through the country along the practically dry beds of the Shat en Nil and the Shat el Kar, considerably to the east of its present channel. The mounds of Abu Haba tell Ibrahim, El Ohemir, and Nifer, marking the sites of the critical cities of Sippar, Kutha, Kish, and Nippur all lie to the east of the river, the last two on the old bed of the Shat en Nil. Similarly, the course of the Shat el Kar, which formed an extension of the Shat el Nil below Sukele Fej, passes the mounds of Abu Hatab, Kisura, Farah, Sharupak, and Hamam. Waka, Irech, stands on a further continuation of the Shat en Nil, while still more to the eastward are the mounds of Bismaya, and Joka, representing the cities of Adab and Uma. Senkera, the site of Lhasa, also lies considerably to the east of the present stream, and the only city besides Sumeria, which now stands comparatively near the present bed of the Euphrates, is Ur. The position of the ancient cities would alone prove that the Euphrates have transformed their course since the early periods of Mesopotamian history. Abundant evidence that this was the case is furnished by the contemporary inscriptions that have been recovered. The very name of the Euphrates was expressed by an ideogram signifying the River O Sippar, from which we may infer that Sippar originally stood upon its banks. A Mesopotamian contract of the First Dynasty period is dated in the year in which Samsu Iluna constructed the Wall of Kish on the bank of the Euphrates, proving that either the main stream from Sippar or a branch from Sumeria flowed by El Ohemir. Still further south, the river at Nippur, marked as at El Ohemir by the dry bed of the Shat en Nil, is termed the Euphrates of Nippur, or simply the Euphrates, on contract tablets found upon the site. Moreover, the city of Shurapak, the native town of Utnapishtim, is described by him in the Gilgamesh epic as lying on the bank of the Euphrates, and Hamu Abi, in one of his letters to Sin Idinam, bids he clears out the stream of the Euphrates from Lhasa as far as Ur. These references in the early texts 
cover practically the whole course of the ancient bed of the Euphrates and leave but a few points open to conjecture. In the north, at an earlier period, a second branch broke away from the Euphrates at a point about halfway between Sippar and the modern town of Fallujah and, after flowing along the present bed of the river as far as Sumeria, rejoined the main stream of the Euphrates either at or probably below the city of Kish. It extended these western channels which afterward drained the earlier bed and we may conjecture that its waters were diverted back to the Euphrates at this earlier period by artificial means. The rivers tend to always break away westward and the latest branch of the stream still further to the west left the river above Sumeria at Musaib, Burz, the site of Busipa, stands upon its upper course, suggests an early date for its origin, but it is quite possible that the first city on this site, because of its proximity to Sumeria, got its water supply using a system of canals. However, this may be the present course of this most western branch, is marked by the Nar Hindaya, the Bar Nejef, and the Atesh rejoins the Euphrates after passing the Samawa. In the Middle Ages, the Great Swamp started at Kufa, and it is possible that even in earlier times, during periods of inundation, some of the surplus water from the river may have emptied itself into the swamps or marshy land below Borsippa. The exact course of the Euphrates south of Nippur during the earliest periods is still a matter for conjecture, and it is quite possible that its waters reached the Persian Gulf through two, if not three months. It is confident that the main stream passed the cities of Kisura, Shurapak, Erech, and eventually reached the Gulf below Ur. Whether after leaving Erech, it turned eastward to Lhasa and southward to Ur, or whether it flowed from Erech direct to Ur and Lhasa lay upon another branch, is not yet settled. The reference in Hammurabi's law, code cited in favour of the former view. Another point of uncertainty concerns the relation of Adab and Uma to the stream. The mounds of Bismaya and Joka, which mark their sites, lie to the east, off the line of the Shatel Kar, and it is quite possible that they were built upon an eastern branch of the river, which may have joined the Shatel Hai above Lagash, and so have mingled with the waters of the Tigris before reaching the Gulf. Despite these points of uncertainty, it will be noted that every city of the Sumerians and Akkadians were built for the sky gods and located on the Euphrates or one of its branches, not upon the Tigris, and the only exception to this rule appears to have been in Opis, the most northern city of Akkad. There were astronomically reasons for this, which Enki laid down. The preference for the Euphrates may be explained because the Tigris is swift and its banks are high, and thus it offers far fewer facilities for irrigation. With their lower banks, the Euphrates, during the time of high water, tend to spread over the surrounding country, which doubtless suggested to the early inhabitants the project of regulating and using water supply employing reservoir and canals. Another reason for the preference may be traced to the slower fall of water in the Euphrates. During the summer months, with the melting of the snow in the mountain ranges of the Taurus and Nephetes, during the early spring, the first flood water is carried down by the swift stream of the Tigris, which rises in March and, after reaching its highest level in the early part of May, falls swiftly and returns to its summer level by the middle of June. The Euphrates rises about a fortnight later and continues at a high level for a much more extended period. Even in the middle of July, there is a considerable body of water in the river and it is not until September that its lowest level is reached. On both streams, irrigation machines were doubtless employed as they are at the present day, but in the Euphrates, they were only necessary when the water in the river had fallen below the level of the canals. There was no natural division between the lands of Sumer and Akkad, such as marking them off from the regions of Assyria and Mesopotamia in the north. While the northeastern half of the country bore the name of Akkad, and the southeastern portion at the head of the Persian Gulf was known as Sumer, 
The same alluvial plain stretches southward from one to the other with no change in its general character. Thus, some opinions have previously existed as to the precise boundary that separated the two lands. Additional confusion has been introduced by the rather vague use of the name Akkad during the later Assyrian and Neo-Mesopotamian periods. Thus, when referring to the capture of Nana's statue, Elamites, Ashur Banipal, puts Iana, the temple of Nana in Iraq, among the land of Akkad, a statement which has led to the view that Akkad extended as far south as Erech. It had been pointed out that on similar evidence furnished by an Assyrian letter, it would be possible to regard Eridu, the most southern Sumerian city, as in Akkad, not in Sumer. The explanation is to be found because the Assyrians, whose southern border marched with Akkad, the last name was often used loosely for the whole of Mesopotamia. Therefore, such references should not be employed for determining the original limits of the two countries, and it is necessary to rely upon information supplied by texts of a period earlier than that, in which the actual distinction between the two names had become blurred. From references to different cities in the ancient texts, it is possible to form, from their context, a very fair idea of what the Sumerians themselves regarded as the limits of their land. For instance, from the Tello inscriptions, Lagash was in Sumer, thus the god of Ninjursu, when informing Gudea on serpent symbolism, told the Patesi of Lagash that prosperity shall follow the building of Ininu, promises that oil and wool shall be abundant in Sumer. The temple itself was in Lagash, is recorded to have been built of bricks of Sumer, and after the building of the temple was finished, Gudea prays that the land may rest in security, and that Sumer may be at the head of the countries. Again, Lugal Zagisi, who styles himself king of the land, i.e. the land of Sumer, mentions among cities subject to him, Erech, Ur, Lhasa, and Uma, providing that they were Sumerian towns. The city of Kesh, whose goddess, Ninkasag, is mentioned on the steel of the vultures, with the gods of Sumerian towns as guaranteeing a treaty between Lagash and Uma, was probably in Sumer. And so too must have been Isin, which gave a line of rulers to Sumer and Akkad in succession to Ur. About Eridu in the extreme south, there could be no two opinions. Besides Agad, or Akkad, Sipa, Kish, Opis, Sumeria and Borsippa are indeed situated beyond the limits of Sumer and belong to the land of Akkad in the north. Between the two groups lay Nippur, another Enki stronghold somewhat nearer to the southern than to the northern cities and occupying the unique position of a central shrine. There is little doubt that the town was initially regarded as within the limits of Sumer, but from its close association with any claimant to the hegemony, whether in Sumer or Akkad, it gained a particular intermediate position over timeline between the two countries. Of the names Sumer and Akkad, neither was in use in the earliest historical periods, though the former was probably the older of the two. At a comparatively early date, the southern district was referred to simply as the land, par excellence, and probably the ideogram by which the name of Sumer was expressed was initially used with similar meaning. The twin titles Sumer and Akkad were first regularly employed as a designation for the entire country by the kings of Ur, who united the two halves of the land into a single empire and called themselves kings of Sumer and Akkad. The earlier Semitic kings of Agad and Akkad expressed the extent of their empire by claiming to rule the four quarters of the world. While the till earlier king, Lugal Zagisi, in virtue of his authority in Sumer adopted the title King of the Land, in the ancient cities, before the period of Inatum, no general title for the whole of Sumer or of Akkad is met within the inscriptions that have been recovered. Each city with its surrounding territory formed a compact state and fought with its neighbours for local power and precedence. The names of the cities occur by themselves in the titles of their rulers, 
and it was only after several of them had been welded into a single state that the name was felt for a more general name or designation. Thus, to speak of Akkad, and even perhaps Sumer, in the earliest period, is to be guilty of an anachronism, but is pardonable. The names may be employed as a convenient geographical terms, as for instance, when referring to the country, we speak of Mesopotamia during all periods of its history.